مرحبا اليوم راح نحكي عن الاوزان وخاصة اوزان الفعل We're going to be talking today about patterns especially verb patterns This video will be a little bit short because I don't think that the book does a bad job of explaining this I'm just adding in a little bit more information and reinforcing some things So الجذر والوزن الجذر is the root and الجذر consists of about two to four consonants there are some rare five consonant roots, but usually everything gets cut down to four consonants. And these are just consonants. You have to think of them as abstract, unconnected, consonant things that are just something that stay in order. They hold the core meaning, but they cannot be pronounced. They are not a word. So, there are a lot of words that come, that have the consonants, share the consonants, k, t, and b, or that share the consonants sh, sheen, ra, ba. But you can't pronounce those. It's just, you can't really say the word right? It just doesn't, it's not a word. And the wezen is the pattern into which these consonants are slotted. And patterns of consonant, patterns can be consonants, they can be vowels, they can be something that's a little bit abstract, like this vowel in the center gets doubled. We have a shed on it, right? You can almost think of it as the wezen are the are sometimes actual letters, but also the marks that we put above the word. When you have a pattern, the consonants get slotted into that pattern, and we understand that pretty well at this point. Also, patterns tend to have meanings in the sense that they make a certain kind of word out of the core meaning of the jether. All right. So fa'il. Remember, we use that notation to indicate meanings, makes a lot of adjectives. So, kabir, kabara, is a root that has a whole lot of to do with bigness or greatness, largeness, right? Sa, ra, has to do with smallness. But we can't say small, but it's going sghur, right? You have to say an actual word, saghir, right? Same with tawil, all right? So, all words are the intersections of roots and patterns. Any word in the Arabic language has to be an intersection of a pattern and a root, all right? Even if that pattern never occurs in any other word, which is really rare. Almost every word pattern has many words in that pattern. When we come to awzan al-fa'l, the awzan of the verbs, this is where it gets very important because these patterns are super useful and very productive. Like every verb of course, it's going to have to be in some pattern, right? Because every word in Arabic is in some pattern. But it's really important because in Arabic, verbs are everything. Arabic is a verb-heavy language, right? Verbs can do a whole lot more than they do in English. So in Arabic, we might say, صغر, he was small, all right? That could be used in a state of sense. In English, we have to say he was and then an adjective, right? In Arabic, it's all one verb. Verb patterns tell us how to pronounce the verbs. They tell us something about the meaning of the verbs. They allow us to know the past, present, mustar, and a few other forms just by knowing which particular form, which wezen we're dealing with. All right? They're matching sets. So all verbs that are of wezen two will have a similar sounding past, a similar sounding present to one another, and a similar sounding mustar form. The one boogeyman of all of this is al wazan wahid. al wazan wahid is kind of an unpredictable form. If you stick through to the nerds, the section for nerds only at the end of the video, I'll talk about what well, you can predict it to some degree, but it might confuse you, so don't worry about it. There's no extra stuff, all right? This is the most basic form, and a lot of times you can get a good sense of the basic meaning of a root, al-jadr, which is not a word, but you can get a sense of what the jether means from the form one verb, all right? There are a lot of, it's unpredictable exactly what form this will take, but they're all, they all share basically the same thing. There are th uh, two internal vowels in the past tense, and they can be, they can vary. So you can have fa'al, or if we say it in fosha, right? Fa'ala, fa'ila, fa'ula, right? Using the past tense masculine singular hua form. Right? In the present tense, you have yef, al, yef, el, yef, ol. Notice how it's always two syllables there in the present tense. 
This means because it's only the vowel in the middle that changes, right, that in the past tense, the fa, the first letter, always has a fa ta in it. In the present tense, the ye always has a fa ta in it. Because of that, you can just really write the middle vowel. So sometimes you'll see in reference works, like in the, in the dictionary, it just tells you what the middle vowel is. Because you should be able to pronounce the rest of the word around that because it's always the same. The vowels of the past and the present aren't really linked. But again, see the nerd section if you really are interested. You need to memorize both, all right? The mustard form for these is also totally unpredictable. You just have to memorize it, all right? So, ketaba yektub el kitaba, for example. El kitaba, you just can't guess that. Um, it sounds similar to some other ones, like edirasa, but it's just not necessarily something you can totally guess. So, shariba Yeshrab Esherb. Esherb is the mustard, like drinking, is the mustard for that. You just can't predict it necessarily, you just have to memorize it. Luckily for all the other Auzen, from Wazen Ethnain, the Wazen Ashera, they're totally predictable. If you know the Wazen, you know the vowels and the other pronunciation facts about a word without even having to look it up in a dictionary. Isn't that great? Of course, there's some extra stuff. Sometimes there's double consonants, there's an aleph in the middle, there's a te at the front. These I then come with that extra stuff, and that's just part of it. In terms of the meaning, every wesin is associated with one or more meanings, but not 100%. So, for example, darasa is to study. Darasa is to teach, to make someone study. Wesin, if named, normally has something to do with making something causative, to make someone do the action expressed by wesin one. So we could say, Sharrabahu al Asir. He gave him juice to drink. He made him drink juice. So the function of these wezens, what makes them useful, is that we can pronounce unpredictable words, and we can also start to notice these patterns of meaning. Remember, they're kind of subtle. So for example, with the root darasa, right, that is not a verb, it's just a root. But in wezen 1, darasa is pronounced darasa in the past, yedrus in the present, notice the u sound there, and the fatha in the past, and edirasa. You can't predict any of those pronunciations just by seeing those letters and thinking I want a verb, all right? For wasn't name, you can't. In the past tense, it's darasa. In the present tense, it's uderis. And the muster is etedris. You can totally predict that just by knowing having memorized a wasn't a thing. You could be like, I just want a wasn't a thing from any verb. You can do it. Notice all the different changes that you have here. In the past and the present in form one, those change. Notice that in form two, even the vowel above the conjugation, you, is different than in the present tense. All right, so notice that these things differ between the auzen. It's a whole complete package. Now, in a lot of European languages, we have what are called irregular verbs. You just have to memorize an entire paradigm, all of the past tense with all of the person markers or whatever, all of the present tense with all the person markers. Because they're European languages, they usually have three different kinds of past tense, etc., etc. In Arabic, all irregular verbs are what I call regularly irregular. So there's an intersection of roots, right? that happen to be weird, with patterns that happen to be normal. So what's a weird root? Well, sometimes you have what we call a doubled root, where the last two letters are the same. We've met a couple words like this. So we know the word sof. What's the root, right? We need three consonants. The root is actually sod, fa, fa. All right? Um, same with hak, or hukuk, right? We know hukuk, the kulit al hukuk, the uh, law college, right? It's actually ha, ka, ka, right? And that's going to change how the verbs are ex end up being conjugated a little bit. There's also another kind of weird root where you have a wow or a yeah as a root letter. And of course, there are three letters. You could have three places it could be. It could be the beginning, the middle, or the end. We know a ton of verbs that have a wow as the middle root letter. Shah, yeshuv, right? Brah, yeruh, ken, yakun. All of those have that nice root letter in the middle. 
um, of, of being a wow, right? Arada, you read, has a ya yeah in the middle. We can see that in the present tense form. And sometimes you get those uh, wow or ya yeah as the last letter. So haka, yahki, right? We know that verb a lot. We say it a lot. Haka, yahki, to, to, to speak. Um, the last letter, the root letter is a ya, yeah, and it changes um, in various ways. Sometimes you can have a hamza as a root letter. And we know the word para yakra. You need to learn these by example. So if you have one example of one of these particular words, you can basically extrapolate to all the other words that are similar sounding. So notice how we were able to figure out the past tense of the verbs yeshuv, yeruh, and yakun just by knowing the past tense of the verb yakun, because they all act exactly the same. Now finally, if you're confused already, don't watch this, it'll just make you more confused. Come back to it in a year, all right? It turns out we can actually predict pretty well what the past tense vowels of our form one, for form one, what the past tense vowels are by knowing the present tense vowels. This is nice because we mostly know the present tense right now. It's harder um, for us to know the past tense right now. So this works out pretty well. Basically it goes like this, and I'm going to go from the bottom to the top because it's easiest. The present tense is a kasra, and the past tense is a fatha. No exceptions, almost zero exceptions on that one. The present tense vowel is a dhamma, and the past tense will be a fatha. So yaktub ketaba. The only exception here is if it's a stative verb, and we don't really know any of these, and we're not going to learn a lot of these. But if someone says yakbur, He's, he is becoming big, or being big, then the past tense would be kebor, he became big. Finally, if the present tense vowel is a fatha, then the past tense will be a kasra, so yeshrub, shareba, unless it's directly bordered, which means the second or third letter, is a guttural sound, and then it's usually a. Ah. So the, word, the verb yef'al, means to do, right? We use it as an example, but it's also a real verb. The past tense is fa'ala. Notice that the guttural needs to be right next to, it needs to be the second or third letter, right next to that vowel. Otherwise, you get yamel, amila, right? So this is actually nice in that you can do some predicting. Don't worry too much about memorizing this rule. Try to just memorize the forms, because that's going to be more helpful, because you need to be able to produce them instantaneously anyway. Use your ears more than your brain. But this is something you need to know.